Hello, my name is Ava. On behalf of the church here at Northside, I'd like to welcome you and say that it is the great honor that you are here to worship with us today. I've been a part of this church my whole life and I can honestly say that Northside is a special place. I hope that'll be a special place for you as well. If you have any questions about the service or what's going on here at Northside, just click the link below. Thank you for joining us. just as we are. How amazing is that? Just as
good morning. A little clean up here this morning. It is great to see everyone today. I always feel like when we sing doxology there at the end, it's almost like that national anthem before uh, a ball game, you know, and I'm waiting for everybody just to jump up and like, let's go, right? <laughs> Uh, land of the free. All right. Uh, with that being said, we are in week four uh, of our deep dive study into the book of Romans, right? And today we are certainly uh, going head first into this. You know, historically, uh, American law schools, which by the way included Harvard as well, again, historically, actually use the book of Romans in order to teach students how to present and prepare an argument right? Or, or, or a case, if you will. And for the purpose for that, or the reason is because from the first verse to the last verse, from chapter 1 and verse 1 all the way through uh, chapter 16 and verse 27, that's exactly what Paul's doing. And, and in a perfect way, he's, he's building a case and he's resolving all the questions that everyone might have along the way as he goes. Now, remember, this was a letter that was written by Paul, just a single letter, like you would write one today, distributed to the churches, right? Uh, later, uh, 13th century, you know, man versified this letter and, and, and chaptered it, if you will, put chapters to it, right? And so with that said, then, as we look into this letter and find ourselves uh, today in chapter 3, and, and by the way, if you've not yet uh, picked up one of our scripture notebooks, there are still some available, strongly encourage you to do so. Just a great way for you to take notes and to keep up with this and a great resource for you to keep even beyond this series. Also in our church app, all of the scripture references, and I got a bunch of them today, uh, they're all in there as well, not only from Romans, but uh, other verses as well. So as we dive into chapter 3 then, what you're going to see that uh, Paul uh, takes this chapter, and in particular the, the first half of the chapter, and kind of does this Q&A with himself, right? He, he puts together these hypothetical questions, but these questions that he knew was on the heart and minds of the people, and then answers them. So that's how he's, he's building his case, he's building his argument, and answering all the questions that people would have along the way, right? It, it's kind of like if you ever, you ever had someone say to you, or maybe you've said it to someone your, yourself, hey, before you say no, hear me out, right? Yeah, yeah. If you're a parent in this room, you have been faced with that. Amen? I like the child, they're, 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 they do it as they gain a little age and, and wisdom, right? As they get a little bit older, maybe it's, it's a curfew question, right? Uh, and they, they'll come, hey, Dad, um, I, can I extend my curfew this weekend? And before you say no, right, uh, l l let me tell you that, uh, first of all, here's the reason why, right? We're going to be uh, at this uh, movie, and it goes a little late, and we're, we're going to my friend's house, and their parents are going to be there. You can call and check on them, uh, and, and I would go ahead and spend the night, but you know, i got practice early in the morning. So they'll lay their argument, their, their case out, in hopes that by the time they get to the end of it, you'd be like, okay. Now, have they just come in with, hey, I want to extend my curfew time? No, right? That's a rule. But as they lay their case out, they, they, they kind of uh, uh, appeal uh, to, to, to your emotions, right? It, and you may likely appease them. Well, that's exactly what Paul's doing here. And you may recall his argument last week was this, that, that being a child of God was not based, uh, on, it wasn't a, an issue of heritage, right? But, but rather an issue of the heart. And so as, as he was dealing primarily not only with the, with the Jews that were in the church in Rome, but also their interaction with the, the Greeks or the Gentiles that were in that church as well, this was certainly an issue for them. And so Paul's overarching theme then has been religious people need Jesus, and non-religious people need Jesus. So with that said, let's jump in this morning, chapter 3 of Romans, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, so what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Considerable in every way. First, they were entrusted with the very words of God. What then? If some were unfaithful, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. Let God be true, even though everyone is a liar. As it is written that you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? I'm using a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? Absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if by my lie God's truth abounds to His glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, just as some people slanderously claim we say, let us do what is evil so that good may come. 
their condemnation is deserved. Now, I'll remind you, in in chapter 2, Paul had clearly stated, right, that, that, that being Jewish would not save you neither by heritage nor by circumcision, by some sort of act as a Jew or someone who had converted to Judaism, right? And and so as he lays that out, and and on that backdrop of the the canvas, if you will, then he begins to paint this picture, and he does so by anticipating these three questions that we see in verse 1, verse 3, and verse 5. And so the first question we see there is in verse 1, and he basically asks, what advantage does a Jew have? Right? Well, what advantage? If you're, if you're say, if Paul, it sounds like to me, you're saying we have no advantage, right? And regarding salvation, they don't. Regarding salvation, that there is no advantage to the Jew. And verse 2 tells us, that, though, that there are some advantages, right? That they were, they were given the advantage of the, the Old Testament. They were given not only the law, but, but all of the Old Testament. They were, they were given the, the prophets. And yet, they rejected the Messiah. Oh, they had an advantage, they had it in writing that Jesus would come, how he would come, when he, uh, wh- how he would die. It was all there before them. They knew it, but still rejected. But for that, that doesn't negate, though, the significance or the, the importance of the Old Testament Scriptures. In fact, as you look through chapter 3, uh, you'll remember, every, I said every time you see bold text, that's a reference to the Old Testament. Well, you'll see that repeated throughout chapter 3. Uh, often, Paul is quoting Old Testament verses within his argument for the justification of faith in Christ alone, right? He is using the Old Testament for that. And so Paul wasn't saying that that religion is wrong because that was kind of a chip on the the shoulders of of the Jewish people as well. He wasn't saying religious is wrong, but what he was saying is your religion must be based on a relationship with Christ, right? Same is true today. In fact, if you you jump over to chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, Paul gives eight different uh, advantages, if you will, that the Israelites had, right? He said, my goodness, you, you guys had the, uh, the Old Testament, you, you had the, the, the patriarchs, you had the covenants, you had all, uh, all, all of the, the, the festivals, and you had all of that, right? So he lists them out. And, but again, he's not saying religion is wrong, but it's got to be based on that relationship. So ultimately, what benefit, what, what advantage of being a Jew well, there was plenty. What, what advantage or what benefit is there to being raised in church, going to church? Plenty, right? What, what advantage is it of being raised in a godly Christian home? Plenty, amen? But that won't save you. Uh, being Jewish, that, there were some advantages there, but, but that wouldn't save them either. That, though there are advantages, that, those advantages won't save you. Friends, today, in the Holy Land, in the Middle East, a Jew, a Jewish person who does not recognize Jesus as the Messiah is just as lost as a Muslim in that same area who doesn't acknowledge Jesus as the Savior. Amen. Are there advantages? Sure there are. But those advantages won't save you. There, there is no salvation. This is really what Paul was getting to uh, uh, of osmosis or heritage. Just because granddad, just because mom is a godly woman, that doesn't mean that's naturally going to be imputed to you. It's about a personal relationship. Well, his second question then is found in verse 3. And here's basically what he says. Does, does man's unfaithfulness then cause God to break his promise? God said that all of the descendants of Abraham are, are going to be saved, or his children, and now you're saying this, this unfaithfulness uh, severs that salvation. Uh, so does that mean that, that God's breaking his promise? And Paul responds, absolutely not. God's sovereignty, and, and here's what he's getting to here, God's sovereignty, right, he is sovereign, right? You can't um, make his plans and you can't change his plans, all right? God is sovereign. But God's sovereignty and man's responsibility go hand in hand. They, they always have and, and, and they, they always will. In fact, it's here in verse 4 that Paul, you notice the bold again. That means Paul's quoting the Old Testament. Well, what Old Testament passage is he quoting? He's quoting Psalm 51. Now, Psalm 51 is David's cry of repentance after he had had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba found out that she was with child, 
then sent her husband to the front line and basically murdered him. Nathan then uh, confronts David on what he had done, and David is a broken man. And, and he cries out before God, God, you, you know the sins of my heart. You know that I alone am a sinner. And, and this, this entire psalm is him repenting. Now, why is that important? Well, that was King David. He was the anointed king of Israel. That was David, a man after God's own heart. And yet, when he sinned, he still came to that place of repentance. Well, then the third question, verse 5. If our sin is the very thing, then, that, that highlights God's grace, doesn't, make that, doesn't that make our sin a good thing? I mean, that, that's what he's saying. In fact, you notice what Paul says here. Look what he says. I'm using a, a human argument, right? He, th this is what he's saying. This is so foolish, I hate to even bring it up. Right? That's what Paul's saying here, all right? But if the more we sin, the better God looks, well, then isn't it wrong for him to punish our sin? I mean, you think about it. More I sin, I'm just making God look better. Isn't that a good thing? That's literally the, the question that was on the, the heart and the minds of the people. And what's Paul's response? Absolutely not. And while, while we may sit here today and say, well, I sure don't drink from that well. I never go out and sin just because I think it's going to make... I, I don't live there. Let me ask you a question. How often, though, do we as believers who have the Holy Spirit deposited and, and a conscience of that Holy Spirit, how often do we know that something's wrong and yet still choose to do it knowing that God will forgive us? Hmm? Hmm? I mean, that's the way that would be opposed to us today, right? Now, we may not say, oh, I'm going to sin just to make God look better. But we will sin and think, well, I know God will forgive me. See, we'll, we'll take God's grace for granted. Will we not? Will we not? We do. Hey, I do. Amen. We, we know better, and yet we still choose to sin. To sin, we're doing the same thing. Remember our four questions? Now, I said when we read Scripture, what was God saying then and what's He saying now? And based on that, what does He want me to know and what does He want me to do? Well, well, what was God saying then to the Jews? That was something they were struggling with. And what's He saying to us today? See, the Jews said, I'm a chosen person. I'm a de descendant of Abraham. I'm good. Well, the Christian today says, I'm a child of God. I'm good. I checked that box. I went to Sunday school when I was a kid. I got baptized. I, I checked that box. I'm a member of a church. What's the name of it? Oh, I don't remember. But, you know, I'm a member, right? I, I've checked that box. We, we do the same thing today. Friends, I, our sin <laughs> does not make God look good. Our sin just makes us look bad. And that being said, that those who say then, uh, look in verse 8 right there. There are those who say, let us do what is evil so that good may come. Something good will come out of it then, Right? Now, some actually believe that this is where Judas Iscariot ascribed. And that he thought that, that his act would actually bring forth the resurrection of Christ. But notice what Paul says. Clearly, plainly, they are condemned. If you can sin and have, have no conscience about that, have no worries, do so, just say, I'm just going to make God look better. That, hey, something good will come out of this, and I'm purposely sinning, then Paul says, you're condemned. But listen, neither does your sin nullify God's grace, all right? It doesn't, we don't sin to make him look better, but neither do we sin to a point that, that God can no longer forgive us. His grace is not dependent on our sin, but our salvation is dependent on his great grace. Let's keep reading verse 9 then. <clears throat> what then? Are we any better off? Not at all. Man, you're talking about from, from one extreme to the other. Right? What about all those advantages, Paul? Not at all. For we have all already charged that both Jews and Greeks, all right, we would say Jews and Gentiles, all are under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Now here, Paul's quoting Psalms and Ecclesiastes. You'll notice all the bold text again. 
He's saying, listen, come to that realization, whether you're Jew, Gentile, Greek, in the church, out of the church, religious, non religious, wherever you are, nobody's good. And you can't save yourself. See, our natural instinct is for man, for us to, to work out our own salvation. Right? That's naturally what we're prone to do. And also to cover up our own sin. I mean, it's exactly the first thing Adam and Eve did, right? When sin entered the world, what did they do? They went and hid. And then they went and they sewed together fig leaves. They, they did something to cover themselves. Well, that's what we still do today. Right? We, we sin, and then we think we can do something to make it better. Right? Uh, um, you, men, you really disappoint your wife good. You blew it. What do you do? Well, if I buy her some flowers, right, <laughs> that'll fix it. I bought my wife flowers one time, came home, and I thought I'd done the best thing in the world. I set them out on the table. She came home and said, well, that's going to make my eyes water. No, no, or what was it you said? Or that's going to make me sneeze, right? Not tears of joy, but allergy season, thanks, right? It's not going to fix that, right? Uh, stick to your notes, Dave, stick to your notes. Uh, hey, but, but, but we all do that, right? Like, uh, hey, listen, I, I know I've blown it with God out there, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put on my church clothes. And I don't mean what you're wearing. I, I mean, I, I'm going to do the churchy things. I'm going to go to church. Boy, I really blew it. I'm going to go to Connect Group this week. Hey, I so blew it. Lisa, you need help in the nursery? I'm going to put something in that stewardship box when I leave today. Right? We do. We think, I, I can fix this. I, I can do something to make it right. And ultimately, what you're saying is, God, I don't need you. I got this covered. I, I don't need you. And Paul says that's exactly why you need a holy God. Because, friend, you, you can't cover it. We're not ultimately good at all. And Paul then, man, he, I love it. He starts drilling down even further. He starts naming out body parts. Look at that beginning in verse 13. Here, here he's quoting both Psalms and Isaiah. You'll notice the dark, the, the bold text again. <clears throat> their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. There, there is no fear in, of God in their eyes. Like just every part of you is bad. Right? First of all, he says, every person's bad. And now he says, every part of every person is bad. But why would God, why, why would Paul do this? Right? So many preachers today want to avoid this text. Oh, don't beat them up, bro. Lift them up, right? Uh, boy, that's not what Paul was doing. But what was the purpose? Do you remember last week I said, that, or Paul said it was God's kindness that leads or draws us into repentance? It's, it's his kindness, his goodness. Uh, Titus said it this way, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. Paul says, you, you need to understand, you're jacked up. But the more you realize how jacked up you are, the more you come to see how great God's grace is, how much he loves even you. And so now Paul, following this, and he begins to lay out the, the doctrines of the Christian faith, right? Which ultimately, by the way, construct the, the doctrine of salvation known as soteriology, just a, a fancy word for that. But that's what he begins to lay out. And now today, uh, there's a lot of a terminology <laughs> in chapter 3 in particular, right? Uh, a lot in, in our text today. And here's my fear. I, I think too many people grow up in the church today, and they never hear it. You don't hear the, 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 the doctrines uh, taught. They're, they're not, that, that's not fun. That's not lifting people up, right? They, they, they want to avoid that. And I want to say this, especially for the, for the younger generations. Don't check out on me here, right? The word doctrine simply means teaching. That's what we, so when you, when you hear biblical doctrine, church doctrine, it's just, it's just the teaching of the Word of God. That's it. So biblical doctrine then teaches us about the the nature and the character of God. It's where we get our theology. Not only that, it teaches us also how we can be in fellowship with God and then how we're to live out then our obedience to Him and ultimately even instructions for the church to function. But that, that is what the doctrine, the teachings are for. He said it this way to, to Timothy, whom he loved in 2 Timothy 4.3. He said, be on guard. He said, for the time will come when people... They won't tolerate sound doctrine. 
but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to, to hear just what they want to hear. And, and so, Christian, hear me. What, he, what he's saying is don't, don't gravitate just to, uh, I like this part of the Bible. I don't like that part of it. I like the New Testament. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I, 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 like, uh, I don't like Paul's teachings here. I'd, I'd rather look, look at that Peter's stuff. Well, that just seems a lot, a lot kinder over there. But, but all of Scripture is what Paul's saying is useful for teaching, for, for correcting, for rebuking, what? for making us holy, for making us the church that he desires us to be. Well, let's keep reading then. With that being said, verse 21 but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as the mercy seat by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His restraint, God passed over the sins that were previously committed. God presented Him to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Well, several doctrines that are laid out here, and I'm going to go through them real quickly. Verse 21, we see the, the doctrine of righteousness. A saved person has the righteousness of God imputed to them through that relationship with Jesus Christ. It, what does imputed mean? It's just, it just laid on you. Man, it is lathered on you like butter on a biscuit, right? That, that, that's what he's saying. You didn't deserve you, and yet you receive all of it. That, that's exactly what it means. He, he took my sin, and God gave me his righteousness. That righteousness simply means to be made right with God. Right? He allows us to be right in His presence. Now, it doesn't mean you'll never sin again, but I'm made right with God. You'll never sin again, but you'll never sin. It's not saying you'll never sin again. It is saying you'll never sin the same again. Because when you have that imputed righteousness of God in your life, when you sin now, in, instead of that, that desire to sin, you'll have that, uh, that, 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 that feeling that you have disappointed God, that conviction uh, of the sin. You'll never sin the same. Verse 22 then, though, he says, through faith then to all who believe. Here you see this doctrine, this, this idea of faith through believing. Now, that word believe, you see here in verse 22, you'll also see it repeatedly uh, through, chapter 20, uh, through chapter 4, specifically in verse 24. The Greek word there is the word pistuo. Pistuo. He said, well, David, why does that matter? Because pistuo means not to believe that, but to believe in. There's a difference, right? I believe that if I model Christ in my home, my, my children will be drawn closer to God. I, I believe that will take place. I believe in their salvation through a relationship with Christ. I, I've seen too many homes here where, where godly parents and the kids just go off the rails. Now, they may have modeled Christ. I believe that that gives them a benefit that Paul spoke about, right? That gives them an advantage to knowing who God is. But there's a difference in believing that something exists and believing in. There's a lot that believe that Jesus lived. There are cults out there that believed that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't believe in Jesus alone for salvation. There's a difference. Now, what we also see here, now hear me clearly, salvation is conditional. God doesn't save everyone, right? It's conditional. And the one condition for salvation is faith in Jesus Christ alone. Do you hear me? There is one condition, and that is you believe that you have faith in Christ Jesus alone. There are over a hundred times in the New Testament that, that, that the word faith or belief is declared to be the sole condition for our salvation. Uh, I chose one here. One day there, there was a whole crowd that had gathered around Jesus, and, and the crowd, they don't say exactly who it came from, just, but in essence, the whole crowd was asking the question. And here was the question in John chapter, 20, uh, John chapter 6, beginning in verse 28. What can we do to perform the works of God? That's what they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe 
in the one he has sent. See, the question was about the requirements, plural, of God. What are the, the things we have to do? See that, that plural there? But Jesus' answer was singular. There is only one requirement, and that is that you believe in him, the one that his father sent. And so there is a requirement that you must believe. Now, I was trying to think of an of a illustration here, and I got to think, if I were to write you a, a a thousand dollar check, right? I cut a thousand dollar check, right? And give it to you, right? It's my money. It's my account. It's my check, right? I, I, I put your name on it and I give it to you. Thousand dollars. That's a big check from a preacher, okay? Um, but if I were to give you that, right? You still have to do something with it, right? I mean, you still got to take the check. You got to do something. You got to believe that the check's good, right? Um, we have a family member. I won't mention names, but if they gave us a $1,000 check, I wouldn't waste the gas to go to the bank to deposit it. <laughs> Been there, done that, right? Uh, uh, it, it won't be good. Right? You, you got to believe that Brother David has the, uh, the, the cash in the bank to back up that check, right? You got you to believe it's good. You've got to take that check and you've got to endorse the back of it. They won't do anything with it if you don't sign the back, will they? You've got to endorse it. And then you've got to deposit it into your account. And then, after all that, the money's yours. Now, you think about all those acts. You've got to believe that it's good. You've you got to re receive it. I've got to give it to you. You've got to receive it. And then you've got to write your name on the back. You've got to deposit that check. But everything you've done is in no way considered working for that money. Did you earn that money? No. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't go mow my yard 10 times, 100 times right, to, to earn that $1,000. I just gave it to you. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. But, but you still had to do something with it. See, you exercise faith by believing in God's gift to you. I believe that it's real. I believe in Christ for salvation. You have to receive that gift. You have to receive salvation through Christ. It's His work that's done for you. And when you receive it, it's deposited, it's imputed to you. That's a picture of salvation. That, that's why we all the time refer to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for you are saved by grace and through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's God's gift, not from works. So no man, no one, can boast. Well, he continues with the doctrines. Uh, uh, you, you'll see it not only in verses 9 and 10, but certainly here in verse 23. And here you'll see what is known as the, the doctrine of sin. The, um, the seminary word for that, hamartiology. Right, that'll really bless your day, but that's what it is, right? What's the doctrine of sin? What is hamartiology? It's simply this, everybody's done it. That's it, it's right there. Look at verse 23. All have sinned. You remember in, it was week two, the second part of chapter one, uh, chapter one, verses 29 through 31. Paul wrote it out. Remember, he, he started out with the big sin. And he said, oh, let me just get everybody in this one. They're filled with all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness, envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, malice, gossips, slanders, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Why did he do that so everyone would know, yep, that's me? Can anyone in this room raise their hand to say, I'm exempt from that whole list? Oh, huh? I can't, right? What's he saying? Everyone's a sinner. And I, did you catch this? I, I, I didn't catch this when we were in chapter 1, but, but I caught it when I was looking back over it. After boastful, he says, inventors of evil. He said, y'all so bad, you're making up sin. Like, you're creating new ones. You're, you're inventing stuff that God didn't even know about, right? Like, like that, that's how bad everyone is. And so because of that, then we find verse 24, and that is the doctrine of justification. Now, we've spent time here already. I'll spend very little time now, but a saved person is a justified person. Remember what we said last week? A justified simply means this, just as though you never sinned. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I am now justified because of what Christ did for me. 
And not only are we justified, but the doctrine of redemption. Also in verse 24, a saved person is a redeemed person. Now, when this letter, remember this is a letter, when it was being read to this church in Rome, you have to understand, uh, slavery in that place was still commonplace. The, the horrific uh, atrocities that happened here in America uh, and, and came from overseas, right? That was still happening in this time. And so with, with, the, with the presence then of Christianity, he was leaning into that and said, you know how bad that is, right? And so that word redemption was used when, when someone who was owned by someone else, and by the way, it had nothing to do with your color of your skin. Uh, in, in those days, Joseph was a slave, amen, right? Um, but, but, but all man could be. But if you were a slave, that meant somebody owned you. Now, it may have been because your parents had a debt they couldn't pay off, and so their, their children were taken as slaves. It may be that uh, your, your parents just simply sold you, or it may just be uh, your family was a slave, right? But if you were a slave, you had no rights whatsoever. You were owned. Your, your thoughts were owned. Your, your actions was owned. That's the, the atrocity of, of slavery, right? That you had nothing unless you were redeemed. And see, there was an opportunity that, that even a slave, uh, if there was a debt that was owed, if it could be paid off, that that slave could, could be redeemed, that they could become a free person, free and as equal to anyone else, and that was known as being redeemed. Redemption. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, for you know that you were redeemed, talking about the church, believers, from your empty way of life that you inherited from your ancestors. Not with the perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As a believer, listen, friends, you are justified and you are redeemed. That sin that once owned you, it don't own you anymore. You are set free. You're redeemed. Well, he moves then out of chapter 3 and, and into chapter 4. Uh, and I'm going to do a very quick summary of chapter 4 for us because we need to be in chapter 5 next week. But here, really, chapter 4, it's really just talking about Abraham's justification by faith. Now, he also tips his hat, if you will, to, to King David as well in this. But, but why does he spend an entire chapter talking about Abraham? Because remember, to the Jews, they were using Abraham as leverage, right? We're a descendant of Abraham. They, they had tied their salvation back to a person other than Jesus Christ. And so Paul reminds them, hey, Abraham... <laughs> was also justified by faith. And so in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, he says this, for what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, folks, he's quoting Genesis 15, 6 here. That's 400 years before Moses is ever going to be given the Ten Commandments. right? Before that was even a thing, Abraham believed and was justified by faith. Why is that important? Why was Paul saying that? Why is that important for us today? Listen, salvation has always been faith-based. It's not some New Testament thing. Salvation has always been based on faith. In the Old Testament, they had faith in what God was going to do. And in the New Testament, they are told to have faith based on what God did through the person of Jesus Christ. For us today, we know we have the full canon. We, we have the entire New Testament. We understand the promises of God of the Old Testament. We understand the revelation of Christ Jesus as Messiah in the New Testament and the hope now that we have of his second coming. It's always been faith-based. So then chapter 4, what he does here, and I'm, I'm going to give you a very quick summary here. Paul gives several what I believe are irrefutable reasons why justification is by faith. In the first eight verses, you'll see where justification, he says, it's a gift. You can't earn it by works. The, the next day, the verses 9 through 17, then he, he says, since Abraham was justified before he was circumcised, and as I said earlier, centuries before the law was even given, neither can play a role. And then thirdly, as he closes out there, he reminds us that Abraham was justified because of his faith in God alone. Verse 16 in chapter 4, he says this. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace, <laughs> that we are saved by grace through faith, 
It was true in the Old Testament for Abraham. and It's true for us today in 2024. He closes out then with these two verses uh, in chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, these three verses. Now it, was cred- now, it was credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone, but it was also written for us. It will be credited to us who believe in, pastuo, who, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Here's your summary of Romans chapters 3 and 4. You ready? Here it is in a nutshell. We're all sinners. We all need to be justified before a holy God. Jesus alone is our Redeemer. We must by faith believe in Him. And when we do, we will be made righteous to a holy God. That's it. He said, you you looked at Abraham for your salvation. Look to Abraham for his faith. Oh, and by the way, we got a little bit of time. Uh, Do y'all remember the story of Abraham? Oh, yeah, it was all Father Abraham. Yeah, man, Father of many nations, absolutely. God called him, uh, hey, leave the Ur of Chaldeans with your wife, pack up and go, and I'm not even going to tell you where I'm going. And you know what Abraham said? Okay. Now, can you imagine telling your wife that? Hey, babe, <laughs> quit my job, we're moving. Where are we going? Where are you going to work? I don't know, and I don't know, but God just said go. They did. You're going to be a 100-year-old dad. Okay, right? But, and Abraham made some mistakes along the way, didn't he? I mean, a- Abraham blew it at a colossal level, right? Uh, uh, he didn't believe God. He-, he-, he took matters into his own hands with a slave girl. He, he, didn't, he didn't trust in God. When, when times got tough, he, he pimped out his own wife. I mean, Abraham blew it multiple times. And yet still, by faith. And you know, that's not only true for the Old Testament. That was true in Peter's life. Paul was on a mission to, to murder Christians. That was true in Thomas' life. Thomas doubted even as Jesus reappeared. That's been true in my life. You see, being a believer doesn't mean you'll never sin again, but you'll never sin the same again. And when you sin, and when you ask God to forgive you, He will. So the only question is, will you, Pastuo, will you believe in Him? 